Well, we're live from Santa Rosa, California. It's a beautiful day here. The sun is coming out. It's very nice and cool. And of course, uh, most of you know that I'm here in Santa Rosa and uh, maybe some of you don't know this, so it'll be a surprise, but here we are at Dr. McDougall's home and Dr. McDougall, how are you doing today? Good. Finally, we get to be in the same room. <laughs> Could be better. Not across the country, like most weeks. I'm in Dallas, Dr. McDougall here in Santa Rosa. So today we're just going to have um, some uh, a really fun time where we have some questions that you all have submitted and that I have here. And uh, we'll try to get as many as possible. And I know, Dr. McDougall, that this week you're having a 10-day program. We are. In fact, I just finished the lecture. I was trying to get something here. Anyway, I showed you this. I sent all of you this notice. If you if you take a look here, uh, about uh, about this guy, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> it was uh, a guy named Zasim Malhotra, and he uh, uh, is part part of a member of the National Obesity Forum. Think I'm talking about that? Uh -huh. Okay, National Obesity Forum, which I told you was funded by. <clears throat> the British Meat and Nutrition Education Services, three pharmaceutical companies, a diet company, and I labeled him as a Dr. Lard of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Well, subsequent news, and I tried to find it here, maybe I can find it a little bit later. The subsequent news is that uh, there are eight members of this uh, 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 this National Obesity Forum, so-called charity. Yes, for, charity. For, forum quit. Four of the eight members quit after he put out this notice. Really? Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I, I I couldn't get that up fast enough to show you, but if you look it up, uh -huh. you find that this uh, National Beastie Forum, which made worldwide headlines with the article through the Guardian, worldwide headlines to say that it's okay to eat. In fact, you should be focusing on meat and dairy and eggs. You should stay away from those carbohydrates. No. Of course, they mean they mean sugar, but they're not going to right. specify simple sugar. They just give you the broad implication that you're supposed to stay away from. Of rice, corn, potatoes, and so on. Even though if, if you stop them on the dime, they won't admit that. Right. right. So anyway, I, I I I made this. I think it was two or three. Uh, uh, yes, just, just a couple of. Yeah, no, probably and two I weeks sent it ago. out to all of you uh, who are on the on the on the mailing list. And just a few days ago, Jeff Novick, our, our dietitian, who's always on top of these things, sent me a notice that uh, once this recommendation came out through the Guardian about the National Obesity Forum. Charity, 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 charity. by that, uh, you know, part of the meat industry and the drug companies that of the eight members of this charity mm -hmm. form quit on a protest. So, you know, there are some people that, that you can take them to the limit, right? And they just won't take this dishonesty. But, uh, Malhotra, <laughs> you are Dr. Lard <laughs> of the two. United <laughs> Kingdom, and and uh, he thought it was a joke, actually. Said somebody sent him my <clears throat> mailing, thought this was some kind of uh, right. Uh, an insignificant person who was just doing a blog someplace, but uh, the word got out to, oh, to millions have. of people. You are Dr. Lard <laughs> of the United Kingdom, and you share that with Dr. Lard of the U.S., which is Ronald Krauss, who is a uh, head of uh, right. atherosclerosis at Oakland Hospital in Oakland, California. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few more Dr. Lards, like a guy named Tim Noakes in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few Dr. Lards out there. Oh, and I'm sure there are. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> stand up and put a banner across your chest i'm dr lard because i put a banner that says i'm dr potato right or, or i'm dr carrot or i'm dr vegetable mm -hmm. i'd be proud of it but being proud of being dr lard and promoting uh, uh the uh, factory farming and the uh destruction of the planet and killing of uh, thousands of men and women and children wear the label wear the label because you deserve it be proud and i was going to calm down today i already gave one lecture <laughs> yes. at the program i was, was gonna, supposed to be calm down yeah, i was supposed to be nice and quiet that's right you do this and my <laughs> usual submissive I, self don't, didn't you say that i bring out the best in you <laughs> i'm not doing a good job <laughs> yeah you kind of got to keep me quiet yes so just just tell us a little bit about how the 10-day program is going this oh week, let's see we have know. about oh well, you're there this morning yeah i was there this yeah. morning we have uh, about uh, 45 people, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Anthony Lim, who's uh, our our new doctor there. So right. You've met him a few times. You're going to have him on the show. In a couple of weeks, <clears throat> yes. I think he thinks that this is the best week <laughs> that he has uh, uh, every couple of months. So 
uh, he's there and taking phenomenal care. Tiffany told me, I have to tell you, mm -hmm. Tiffany told me, uh, uh, I didn't know she, Tiffany's my, my main assistant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, she's usually very, very polite and quiet and candid and so on. But she told me just a couple of days ago, she said, you know, Dr. Lim's just a lot more nice than you are. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he has said it's so much for the program because I'm, I'm kind of like that straightforward person. You come up to me and you ask a question. I'll give you an answer. I don't mean to be mean, but I just... Uh, you know, I, I just don't have a lot of time for small talk and right. I'm not that kind of Politically. really soft and personal type of person, but uh, Dr. Lynn is. And so I, I was told by, <laughs> by Tiffany that uh, uh, great benefit has been brought to the program to by having, by having they have a real nice guy to deal with. Well, with I'm sure you all want to come and, and meet Dr. Lynn. Sure, we have 45 people. We have yeah. people with diabetes and people with uh, a few with cancer and uh, many, many overweight people who don't understand. That's the lecture I gave this morning. I said, you don't understand, you know, people think it's their fault that they're overweight. You know, there's something psychologically wrong with them. They have an emotional uh, eating disorder. They're obsessive compulsive overeaters. And what I try and tell them, I said, look, you know, it, the problem is the kind of food you eat. And, uh, you know, I'll often give it again in my, in my blunt statements. I'll say that uh, you do not, uh, defy the laws of thermodynamics, you know, calories in versus, versus calories out. You don't get calories from air. And I'll make uh, uh, uncandid comments like there once were no fat people in China. You know, there were two billion of them. <clears throat> but uh, uh, people just don't understand. It, it, it's not like their stomach's too big or they have uh, emotional eating disorders or uh, their appetite's too aggressive. Uh, the problem is the food. Remember in China and Vietnam and Thailand and once in India and uh, in Mexico, just like 50 years ago, there were no fat people. They just could, you couldn't find them. And that's because they lived on starch. So they corn, beans, rice, potatoes, you know, those kind of things. That was their food. And when you switch to the Western diet, you lose all control because it's the wrong kind of food. You don't get the correct appetite satisfaction. It's not the right volume of the food. Uh, and of course, the manufacturers uh, make it so enticing that uh, they'll maximize your consumption. It's not your fault. Anyways, we had that yeah. lecture this morning. And, uh, yeah, the very good lecture. And everybody appreciated my glass stomach. Bottles. The glass stomach, it's always an eye opening. Yeah. And that's somewhere on one of the DVDs that we did. But uh, right. it was a fun, we were a great group of people. In fact, I have to say, you know, and I shouldn't say this, but. <laughs> Uh, I have to say these are probably the nicest, most cohesive uh -huh. group we've ever had. We don't have one, uh, when I say difficult, I don't mean in a negative way, but in a challenging way. A lot right. of people come with personalities. They're kind of challenging. And, uh, and some come because they're being yeah, they're dragged, dragged here. here. <laughs> we don't have any this time. I mean, everybody's really, really easy to get along with. They've made great friends yeah. and, and they're making phenomenal changes. And our team is, of course, at our best. Yes. Yeah. Well, and it did, just for them to see that wonderful buffet oh. of food, that, that's worth it. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah, they can't believe it. They can't believe they can eat that, that much. And, and that good tasting. And that food. good tasting. Yeah. It's, it's surprising. But anyway, we're, you, you just think we're bragging so we can uh, somehow you. you. Yeah, no. But I, I want you to know that all the recipes pretty much are free on the, um, on the website. Yeah. You yourself there. at home. Right. Uh, well, I really enjoyed Mary's uh, talk, uh, like she did last night, making it simple. You know, it doesn't, I see that a lot of people sometimes want to make it difficult. Yeah. It's simple. And yeah. she, her, just a few meals. You, and you, how she you, you, you probably didn't notice, but when you walked through the kitchen a few minutes uh -huh. ago, did you see the crock pot? I saw the crock pot. <laughs> I mean, that's the main one. Of the main, so we're going to have to make sure. on all the time. Yeah, yeah. She'll, she'll have there's beans in the crock pot, clean beans. Right. And she'll have uh, probably make some new potatoes. Uh -huh. That'll be our dinner tonight with a little, uh, a little Thai sauce, uh, mm -hmm. uh, hot sauce on it. And, and that's what we we'll frequently have for dinner. Yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated, and that's that's her her lecture. She really drives that yeah. point. She sure has my lesson. She was her best. Yeah. And the other lecture about <clears throat> eating out, like a lot of you have have questions about that. But all a lot of this is free on your website, and mm -hmm. I think we're going to do a, a, a webinar soon where we'll show you how you can really have all ninety nine percent of your questions answered if you just know where to look. Yeah, we're going to do a whole thing on I website. think that it's very good because. 
we get a lot of questions that really you can have them answered right there, right then when you have them, if you know where to look them up. It's, sh it's shocking to people. I, I must get an email once a week because somebody says, I've been looking for the gimmick yeah. for the whole week. I, I can't find, where's the gimmick? Exactly. <laughs> you know, and I say, well, it really isn't a gimmick. We just provide all this for free uh, once because, in part, because we couldn't even give it away. Nobody wanted to hear it. But also because Mary and I, uh, we've been eating this way for uh, well, since about 1977, so mm -hmm. almost 40 years. And uh, we've gained such great benefit for ourselves and our family, and our children and grandchildren, as we feel that uh, this is just a small price to pay back. Yeah. So when you go to the website and you hit the search engine or the hot top, and then we'll, we'll spend a, a webinar going yes, over that. Yes, you'll, I you'll think find that everything great. you want there. You can't go to Kauai with us for free. <laughs> Yeah, and you're not going to Alaska with us in two weeks for free uh, or the program. But if you want the information or share it with your <clears throat> friends and relatives, it's all free. And I've also I'd like to mention again the color picture book, which is, by the way, it's uh, I've got the copies from Harper One uh -huh. and they did a beautiful job. Oh. It's going in the new book that you can order on Amazon now called The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. And they, uh, the artwork is, uh, I would say, at least as good, if not better, than it's on the website for free. In over 23 languages, and uh, you're going to like it, <clears throat> like this book when it call, comes out called "The Healthiest Diet on the Planet," because uh, there's a simple three chapters in the front. There's the color picture book, and then Mary has I don't know how many recipes, but some of them. It's the first time she's done uh, recipes right. in color and pictures. Oh. So it's going to be a unique book. I, I was worried when we first started this project. In fact, I wouldn't do it until they agreed to put the color picture book in. I was worried that uh, it wasn't going to be something we were proud of and. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about it, but we have now like 13, this will be our 13th book out. And every one of them, we feel like they're our children. It's, yeah, yes, yes. And it's coming out in S September. In September. Yeah. So it's very soon. The healthiest, healthiest uh, diet on the planet. Yeah. That, was, that was the actually the, uh, the editor's idea. When he when he came to us, and <clears throat> it was a January of... Uh, I guess it was January of the year before. Yeah. We were working on that one. Anyway, yeah, he had this title in mind. It was going to be the healthiest diet on the planet. And I had in mind that I wanted to publish, I think it was 2015, January. And I wanted to publish my color picture book. And so we had, he had his thought about what the <laughs> title should be. Yeah. I didn't really care. It sounded <laughs> good to me. And I, I knew what I wanted in it. And it took us six months. Oh, no, it was January 2015. It took us six months to agree that we were going to do a book together. And thank goodness he was such a, a, a really smart and persistent man. And so we got this book. It's almost done. It'll be done in September. Uh, yeah. We're excited. Very we're like excited. We're really very like excited. You know, we did this uh, really interesting, I thought, uh, webinar last week uh, about the newsletter I did where uh -huh. I revealed myself and I took my shirt off. And I took a picture with my tattoo across my chest that says, mm -hmm. do not calf, I will sue. Right. <laughs> and again, you will find out whether or not that tattoo is really there only if Let's it comes see. So you're not doing it I'm today. not showing it. <laughs> I'm not showing it. But, uh, it, I, you know, I, it, people got really excited about that. And they all gave me great well wishes yes. for my recovery. It's, last year was a tough year for me. But I'm back. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I, made, I made a couple errors. I told you, or the first thing I was concerned about is that everybody was focused on me and my health and my tattoo. Yes. But the only reason I did that was because I wanted you to pay attention to the subject, which was that you're getting all these catheterizations done by cardiologists. that are really criminal behavior, what's going on. And I made a misstatement. I said that it was an analysis of uh, 2,000 people where they can... They looked at people who went in for non-cardiac surgery, like hip replacement, knee replacement, uh, maybe uh, cancer removal or something. Not heart-related surgery. And I told you they looked at 2,000 people and found that half were told they had to have prophylactic revascularization. In other words, they had to have their heart fixed before they fixed their knee. I was wrong. It was 200,000 people they looked at. And half the people who were scheduled for major non-cardiac surgery were first to for, were forced first to have their arteries in the heart repaired. And the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology 
have objected to this kind of behavior since 2007. That's what I want you to focus on. And I also want you to understand that if I just walked up to you on the street, I could tell what the chances are of finding significant lesions based on your age and cholesterol. If you're my age, nearly 70 years old, you have a 91% 91 chance, 91 chance of finding significant blockages. You know, if, if your cholesterol was what mine used to be, which was 338, you have a, if you're less than 40, you have a 91% chance of having significant blockages. In other words, you are a customer, you don't even know it. And these, these cardiologists are doing operations that are unnecessary and condemned on you. I had one cardiologist object uh, to what I had to say. I said I was wrong, exaggerated, foolish, whatever. And I invited him to come on, uh, on the discussion board or maybe on the webinar and to straighten me out and tell me, tell, tell the public what the truth is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I gave you all the research. All you have to do is click on the link and you can see what's going on to you and your family. You know, so get over my tattooed chest, get over my thin half naked body. I did that only to get your attention and to tell you how serious this was, go on and read the rest of the newsletter and study it and confront your doctor with it. And, you know, get ready to save yourself and your friends and family from what's going on. That's all I want to say. Okay. I just wanted to recap wanted to get and I wanted to make sure that, you know, you didn't miss what I was trying to say last week. Right, right. Well, and you know, th those type of distractions uh, happen. I think you've talked before when the media or the industry talks about in, um, other things like um, gluten-free or, or less oh, yeah. sugar, but the real issue of people being obese is really not that. What would you? Well, well what, the, what are the your reason thoughts? people are sick and obese is uh, is because of food poisoning, and the food poisoning is discussed, of course, free on my website. Right. It will be the center of the healthy diet on the planet uh, book that's coming out in September. Food poison is animal food, whether it be a snail or a snake or a cow or a pig or a chicken or a salmon. That's one category of food poison. Now, yeah, you can tolerate some of it and stay alive. You know, I mean, the body's tough. It takes uh, Take down a half a bottle of whiskey a day and two packs of cigarettes. Now, I've tested it. You don't have to test it. So uh, the body's tough, tough, and it'll live on hot dogs. I've tested it. And pepperoni pizza, I've tested it. But uh, <clears throat> if you need to get well and you want clear definition as to what you're supposed to do, one category of food poison is animal foods. Just leave them alone. And the other category is vegetable oil. Leave it alone. And what that's left with you is the traditional diet of human beings. I don't know whether I, I, got, I got corrected on one other thing last week when I, and I do appreciate your corrections. I mean, I try as hard as I can. I told you I never lie, but I do make mistakes. As somebody wrote me, you know, I've said that uh, of the 10 billion people who walked on planet Earth, that over nine and a half billion have lived on starch based diet. And somebody wrote me about a professor who actually calculated the number of people who've been born on planet Earth. Uh huh. And it was an interesting and maybe true. And I just throw it out to you just for fun because maybe I learned something. He said, based on his calculations, which he did, and he's a professor type guy, he said that there have been 100 billion people born to planet Earth. Yeah. Really? So that oh, would mean wow. less than a half a percent have lived on the rich Western diet. The other 99 plus percent have lived on primarily a starch based diet. Right. So, I mean, it, it, the diet that I teach you is the traditional diet of people. You know, I don't teach you a vegan diet. I mean, it is a vegan diet, and I follow a vegan diet. Uh, but what I teach you is, is that the bulk of your food comes from starch, like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what about people that are really into – this is a big topic now in, in several of the McDougal uh, Facebook uh -huh. pages and – people talking about and being confused about smoothies, you know, oh, yeah. and I mean, is it really better to eat the actual fruit that's the way it comes? Okay. And what about smoothie? Or, or is it, does it matter if you're trying to lose weight or if you're not trying? What, what are your thoughts about smoothies? Well, I think the simplest way to say it is you don't improve the quality of a food by beating it uh, 10,000 times with a steel blade. Uh, we know, for example, <clears throat> if you check uh, blood insulin levels, and uh, blood sugar drops that occur if you take somebody and you feed them an apple 
and you watch their blood sugar go up, it just goes up a little bit and then down a little bit. And their insulin levels just go up a little bit. If you take that apple and you put it in a blender and make applesauce, then the blood sugar levels go up just a little bit, but they go down a lot. And you produce a lot of insulin because mm -hmm. you've disrupted the fiber. Right. And then if you make apple juice, in other words, you take the pulp away from the, the, uh, the juice, which is the sugar and water, then the blood sugars go up and they go down a lot. And the insulin levels go way up. So you change the quality of the food when you damage it like that. Is that a big deal? Well, probably not for most people. I mean, I, I personally don't drink juice. The grandkids drink juice. You know, I think healthy people, they'll do just fine. But uh, it's, it's not a matter of getting, uh, I think the reason people juice is they juice so they can get more nutrients out of their food. You don't need no more nutrients. You don't need more calories, which you get when you juice the food. You know, the problems are not problems of uh, nutrient or calorie deficiency in our societies. They're problems of excess. <clears throat> and so the reason uh, carrot juice tastes sweeter than carrots is because you've disrupted the cell fibers and you've let the sugar out of the carrot. So it tastes sweeter. Right. And you're going to consume more calories, uh, have a higher insulin rises, and insulin pushes fat into fat cells. So it's going to be harder for you to lose weight. But again, I, I don't think you should make a big deal out of what I'm saying. This is a minor issue. But if you're having trouble losing weight or you have low blood sugar reactions or things aren't going the way that they should, I mean, do consider un, undamaged food is the way it was supposed to be consumed, you know, just with the, the breaking apart with the teeth, not grinding it with a, uh, with a blender. But, 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 you know, the general story, which is uh, the food was designed correct and people are designed correct, and the bulk of the calories of uh, essentially all civilized populations has come from starch. I mean, those are basic truths that I'm confident that there's no argument against. Right, and another truth is that it's much easier to, I don't know, drink five apples oh, yeah. than to eat them. Oh, yeah. So It'll you can definitely take more calories. That more way. calories, more simple sugar, release more insulin. Even though that sugar is very difficult to turn into fat, human being is very inefficient at converting sugar into fat. It can, but it doesn't do it very efficiently. Uh, right. Cows and pigs, they're, they're pretty good converters, mm -hmm. but they eat all the time too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that your clarification because people do just, they just get distracted into these, you know, juicing and when yeah. they don't should focus on what the issue is. Well, well once true. you get, if you don't get the starch part figured out, which is, as I say, based on these new figures, uh, far fewer than 1% of the human population has uh, lived on anything but a starch-based diet. And it could be 100 billion people. Until you get the starch thing f figured out, you're, you're, you're out of control. It, it, you're going to be hungry. You're not going to enjoy the food. But when I mention pasta to you, or some <laughs> marinara oh, sauce, yes. or I mention those new potatoes Mary's going to make tonight for dinner along with a... Uh, some type of bean stew she's got cooking it in the other room. And you put a little salt on it. You know, you put a little salt, a little simple sugar on the surface of your food to give it even more of a punch if you want. For most of you, some of you can't. Then you start thinking, well, you know, I can do that. I, I mean, I love that. I, I love sweet potatoes or I love uh, bean burritos. Uh, once you get that figured out, then you're satisfied. You eat the diet of world-class uh, athletes like Kenyan, the Ethiopian winners of our recent marathons and triathlons the diet of the gladiators, all of a sudden everything fits. Your animal rights concerns fits, your concern for the popular, uh, for the, uh, for the globe, for, uh, <clears throat> for um, the destruction of our oceans and, and global warming gases and cruelty to animals and species extinction. All of a sudden everything makes sense. I got it. Mm -hmm. You know, but until you get the starch figured out, you're, you're Anyway, yes, we no, answered that so very too many times. Yeah, too many times. But it's it's so true. Until I, there was a day when I, like you said, I got it. Yeah. When I got that the starch was the crucial, crucial. And, <clears throat> and there was someone that wrote one of the questions. This lady said, "Why is it that I'm still hungry all the time following the starch solution?" So um, well, maybe my, my answer is eat. Eat more, probably starch. Maybe yeah, she starch. might be. We don't As know. I say so unkindly, you do not defy the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> you do not get calories from air. And there were once two billion Asians. 
That was like 35 years ago. And not one of them was fat. And you say, well, they were starving and working in the fields. Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes, but a lot of times, most of the time they had enough food. And not everybody worked in the field. There were some of them were ministers and teachers and people who worked uh, very, very low exercise, low energy expending jobs. And yet nobody was fat. You know, the food is so crucial. I would, I would really defy anybody, to be honest, and, and live on a starch-based diet and be significantly overweight. You may put it on an extra three, four, five right. pounds. So, you know, it's, it's about as silly as I did. I tell you about, about the breatharian one time. On the no, show. no. I tell you about the breatharian. <laughs> <laughs> when I lived in Hawaii uh, as a doctor back in the 1970s, the Honolulu Advertiser or Star Bulletin ran a story about this fellow who came to Hawaii. And he gave lectures and he claimed to be a breatharian. That, that's, I, and there are still people out there. I, I, yeah, I have heard. You know, so he lives only on air. air. And then one of the reporters from one of the newspapers started following him around and caught him down <laughs> at 7 Eleven uh, <laughs> buying candy bars. You know, I'm, excuse me, you are not a breatharian. Mm -hmm. you, you, you obey the rules. So if somebody's eating all the time and still hungry, I would find a starch that they like. And I think uh, beans, peas, and lentils are a little bit more hearty mm -hmm. and substantial for them, right. even though they're a little high in protein. And flavor it like you like and eat frequently. When people eat more frequently, they lose more weight than those right. who gorge, say, a couple times a day. And just stick with it. And then if you want, if you want to really push it, you can add more kale and broccoli and cauliflower. We did that in the maximum weight loss form. Mm -hmm. So you can do that, but you, you really have to get the bulk of your calories, at, at least half from starch. Right. A few minutes ago, you were talking about athletes, and I don't know the, the, the topic yeah. was about. And someone actually asked a question about uh, what is the best way to have more calories uh, for physically active and sport uh, active children and adults? Well, that's a good question. We've taken care of two famous athletes, and this is public information, so I would never tell you anything that's not public. Right. Uh, we took care of Carl Lewis uh -huh. uh, in a peripheral way. But Carl Lewis followed the McDougal program. You can find it in Runner's World back, well, probably, <clears throat> probably back uh, in the early 90s. He was on the front cover. It was a whole story about how we fed them, fed him our diet. And I met him in uh, Minneapolis when we were both ready to go on a show called Twin Cities Live. And he was complaining that he couldn't perform as a world-class athlete uh, and, and eat because he would gain too much weight to set records like the 100 meter dash. So I said, Carl, I said, here, read this book. And so mm -hmm. he read the McDougal program and he set the 100 meter dash record, world record for the 100 meter oh. dash. He won three of the longest that's been beaten. Right. And he's from Dallas. He's from Dallas. He's from Dallas. And uh -huh. he run, ran, uh, he won uh, uh, the three longest long jumps ever done. And he set uh, three gold, won three gold medals as an old man. I forget his age, 34, 36. They all did our following our program. And I bet if I talked to Carl today, uh -huh. he would still say he's vegan. Right. That would be my guess. I haven't told I have actually, if you go to my website, there's a, a radio interview I did with Carl Lewis on that, which you can get as a podcast and watch. The other athlete we took care of was Monica Sellis, the world class. And again, this is public information. I would never share anything with you that isn't public. And uh, Mary and Heather went to Wimbledon. Uh -huh. One year, one year, and took care of Monica, the world class uh, tennis player. Yes, yes. and oh, everybody noticed how much weight she lost <laughs> and how uh, good she looked. And... But these athletes, they do need to to pack a little, a few more yeah, calories. Oh, how, right? oh, the answer was, how did they do it? Well, what we did with with uh, both of them was we added uh, more simple sugars to the more simple you know, more juices, uh, more you know, actually real simple sugars to get more calories. And that was the point of your question. Uh, and so that's what we did because you know, just like if you're a runner, you get these uh, runner's drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what exactly right. they have them, but they're, yeah. they're, they're yeah. you know, it's your drink during the race and right. they're, they're just right. bottles of sugar. Right. And, you, and so I, I actually, for some of the athletes we've taken care of in the past, I actually made up a special sugar formula for them for during their event so they uh -huh. can get it. And, and this is the routine athlete type of behavior uh, is when you're in endurance events like a tennis match or a bicycle event is they take sugar water preparations or sugar bar 
preparations along to regenerate their energy and their glycogen, replenish their glycogen stores. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they do need extra, uh, extra what, glycogen. Uh, so uh, what about nuts and seeds? Well, then you're so getting much? something that's 90% fat. Okay. Uh, you're getting a high source of energy, but then you've got to you got to utilize that fat and sugar is so much more efficient yeah. uh, at, uh, at powering the muscles and the machinery than fat yeah. is. So it wouldn't be the right thing to eat unless it was a really, you know, days that to pack your food along and you want to concentrate the calories, then it would be a, a right. food to choose. But there's a whole, uh, the whole uh, segment of, of low carb athletes out there that are trying to yes. prove yeah, that they go through some type of metabolic miracle conversion uh -huh. that makes uh, eating uh, animal foods good for athletic advances. I mean, I wrote a whole, a whole newsletter on that in the last year. Yeah, there was some, uh, something uh, last week in was the it? news, and, and again, people are again confused about low carb uh, diets. Low carb, yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to win, number one. And number two, if you do do well, you're going to drop dead of a heart attack. Eating that kind of food, that that kind of food will promote colon cancer, and heart disease, and strokes, and greasy skin, and and it's bad for animals, and it's horrible for the environment. So, you know, wake up. Uh, you want to chase a two-year-old around, or you want to you want to win a triathlon, then you're going to do it with uh, sugar in the form of starch. You know about carbohydrate loading. You know, athletes eat mm -hmm. pasta and so on. Right. Well, you need to carbohydrate load every day. And when I say sugar, most of you know I'm not talking about uh, table sugar. I, I have them with the athletes. We, we fed them pure sugars for their events. Uh, but I'm talking about sugar in the form of rice and potatoes and corn and pasta and whole grain breads. You know, bread is the staff of life. I mean, people have won, won huge battles with bread as their food uh -huh. or corn as yes. their food. Well, history. Yes, there is a very interesting question here from a physician oh. that says that he has a patient and who is on a whole food, plant-based diet, no oil, starch-based. This uh, patient is normal weight, BMI normal, total cholesterol 142 and LDL 65. She occasionally eats, eats a few slices of avocado. She eats a couple of handfuls of nuts a day. Yeah. Is the saturated fat in these avocados and nuts a problem for the endothelial cells and will it contribute to heart disease? No, no, I don't, no, no. These, are, <clears throat> these are foods designed by nature. Uh, they are uh, designed as a, as a treat, however. You know, avocado trees really only come in bloom one week a year. Right. And nuts, likewise, I mean, they do. Now we have them available. Yeah, they're just so available all the time. So I, I don't think they will injure uh, your arteries. I wouldn't put you on a, a high not high avocado diet if we had some serious circulatory problems right. because that fat will uh, make your blood uh, thicker, uh, more adhesive. Uh, it's not really what you want to do for maximum healing. If you need something you're too thin, you know, it's a, nuts and seeds and avocados would be good foods. And if, like this woman, she's very athletic and she needs more easily accessible calories, or like children, you know, children are running all over the place, and to give them peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, no butter, clean peanut butter. <laughs> right. You know, I don't, I don't think you're talking about a, uh, a really negative thing that doesn't have some significant positive factors. Like it's a lot easier to get <coughs> cal <coughs> calories into high burning people like kids and athletes by feeding, say, nut butters and, and uh -huh. things like that. Right, right. The um, eating, you know, a starch-based diet, like you promote in the starch solution, does that affect the body's acid slash alkaline balance? Do you know? It does. Yeah. It does. Uh, uh, there are a couple things that you know, make it a little complicated. There's something called the renal acid load. And uh, it's a way scientists calculate how much acid is brought into your body based on various foods. So what, what happens is, uh, is acid is brought into the body. The body is slightly alkaline. It's got a pH of 7.4. 7 is neutral. So it's slightly alkaline. And when you eat acid foods, what happens? The body has to neutralize the acid. Well, the real acid foods are the animal foods because they're full of protein, which is made of amino acids. 
And they also have amino acids that are sulfur-containing amino acids, like in methionine and cysteine. And they convert into sulfuric acid. So <clears throat> what you, happens when you eat hard cheese, for example, it's the most acidic of all foods. Uh, you, uh, fish and uh, meat and chicken and shellfish, they're all very highly acidic. Now, grains and legumes, because they're high-nutrient foods, uh, they're designed to, to make a new sprout, a new plant. So they're very nutrient-dense foods. They're also slightly acidic. They get an acid number of one, whereas uh, you know, uh, cheese is 10 times greater. So you do take a little acid with grains and legumes, but enough for the body to handle. So you don't see higher rates of uh, wrist and hip fractures, say, among Japanese. We're talking about times ago uh, who eat uh, high-rise diets. Right. But when you're taking an acid load of uh, chicken and fish and beef and pork and, and uh, hard cheese and things like that, I mean, you're taking uh, an acid load that you can't handle. So your bones dissolve to release alpha material. And that's how you get weak bones, osteoporosis, and that's how you get kidney stones. Right. So really, the uh, as a physician, when you see someone with a high... Mm -hmm. Acidity level in the blood. It's, what does that? Well, you don't see that. You don't see. No, that. not unless they have kidney disease. Uh, or they got to be really sick. Otherwise, because the pH is so carefully guarded in the body uh, uh, to be at a level of seven four, you got to be in terrible respiratory distress. You got to uh -huh. be in kidney failure. So you don't see any changes in the blood. You do see it in the urine. So if you check somebody's urine, and I haven't done this in a long time, but you can do this. You can see they they give a pH level, and you can get an idea of how much acid they're eating because the acid comes out in the urine. Uh, but you're not going to change the pH of the blood, not in any healthy person. Oh, I see. But you will change the pH of the urine. Okay. Wow. But I, I don't recommend people go around checking their urine. <laughs> yes, you should be on an alkaline diet because it's the diet of humans. Yes, the McDougal diet is an alkaline diet. Mm -hmm. uh, you make uh, the like this uh, the dish that Mary's making right now in the crock pot. The beans will be slightly acidic. It'll be at about a level one. But the new potatoes that she's making are minus five. <laughs> so, it so when you mix them together, you know, you turn out with an alkaline diet. Plus that acid load in the beans, peas, and lentils, it's something the kidneys can't handle. But when you get up uh, with, you know, say fish at nine and you know, chicken at six or beef at seven or cheese at 10, yeah. you're, you're, you're dumping an acid load in your body you just can't handle without buffering the bones. Right. And that's when it becomes a very serious problem. So that's when people say that you're eating your bones. <laughs> right into the toilet, your bones. And in the process, they solidify in your kidneys, and they give you the most common, almost exclusive kind of kidney stone, which is a calcium-based kidney stone. Uh, and there's a whole much, much more of that story that I can tell you yeah. about the oxalates and how they form, and it's, it's all from the animal-based diet. So uh, since you mentioned osteoporosis here, someone asked uh, what plant-based foods are best for osteoporosis? Is it important to combine certain fruits with veggies for better absorption? Well, I, I would focus on, uh, on your more alkaline vegetables like spinach, I think is minus 50, 50 Anything degrees. minus is yeah, good. Yeah, it's alkaline. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's some reason to do that. Uh, there's some reason to eat potatoes and sweet potatoes, which are alcohol, as opposed to grains and beans. And is there, are you aware, is there a website or somewhere where people can find what the numbers are? Well, they can. It's in the American Journal of... Uh, the, the American Di 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 Dietetic Journal. It's the Journal of the American Dietetic Association. And it was published by uh, a guy named Renner, R-E-N-E-R. -E okay. So you can look it up that way. To look up, or you just go to the website and look up acid base. Or you go to my website and look up acid base in the search engine. You can get uh, the actual reference. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but uh, I, I think the, uh, the general information is enough for you. I have always, including my, my uh, earliest book was, was published, I think, in 83. I've always identified uh, for people who have osteoporosis, kidney disease, or liver disease to minimize their intake of beans, peas, and lentils. And grains would be added too. Uh, but it gets so much more complex, though. Uh, for example, the, the best diet for a kidney patient is Kempner's diet, which is white rice, which is slightly acidic. 
But I think I can clearly say if you have a problem with osteoporosis or kidney stones, or if you have liver or kidney failure, you really need to limit the beans because they're 30% protein. Right, right. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're healthy, I usually recommend a cup a day maximum. That's a lot of beans. Right. It wouldn't be, would you say that it wouldn't be advisable to eat uh, three, four cups of beans a day? Well, that's or, that's the problem. That's why I put that recommendation in there is because some people would look at uh, the program I put together, which was, uh, as I say, listen, well, 1977, I put it together. Uh -huh. And... Um, they said, "Boy, I, I really like those beans, so I'm going to have, I'm going to have uh, uh, beans, beans, beans and tortillas for breakfast, and I'm going to have a pea soup for lunch, and I'm going to have uh, uh, bean burritos for dinner. And you know, 70 percent of the diet is beans, and that's 30 percent protein. And you only need maybe three to five percent of your calories as protein. And so you got 25 percent extra protein. You got to dump the protein. It's got to be dumped through the kidneys." It just puts an extra right. workload. Right. But again, don't you know? Don't overread what I'm saying. You know, beans, peas, and lentils are healthy foods, but they're a little richer than, say, sweet potatoes and potatoes and rice, and they're very rich in protein. So I think that they should be, uh, you know, consumed with that attitude. The general person, we have beans. Brian and I probably, you know, three, four, five times a week. But I wouldn't recommend somebody even in my good health to have beans three times a day, seven days a week. <clears throat> and then if you have kidney disease, which I take care of patients who have, not only do I limit their beans, peas, and lentils, but I'll actually add table sugar to their diet. Yeah. To get Because rice is 5% protein. And what Kepner found uh, on the rice diet is he had to lower the protein even more in the rice because it was such a burden on a patient with kidney failure that he would add table sugar as much as half the calories coming from table sugar. That was the maximum. So sometimes even, even the natural food for very, very sick people has to be, uh, you have to give them calories without protein because they can't process all the protein if you have serious kidney disease. And you, it even when you add sugar to a kidney patient, and again, I'm getting to the point of confusing people and getting into an area you shouldn't mm -hmm. deal with unless you're, but really, really knowledgeable what, what's going on. But the Kettner diet, when you add the table sugar, you add calories without protein and without potassium, which are two big problems with people with kidney disease. And that's why Kettner used a diet of white rice, use vitamin pills, mm -hmm. but white rice and fruit and juice and table sugar, which is something I have to use in maybe well, maybe two or three patients a year. I have to go to that extent to them because otherwise it's dialysis. And they can often they can often prolong their time away from dialysis and it's worth it to them. That's a tough life being on dialysis. Oh, I, I cannot imagine. And you could just imagine, even if you, if you have dialysis and you go for a kidney transplant, you're asking a friend or relative to give you half their kidney function because they just gave you one kidney. And standard recommendations in the business of kidney disease is to teach the donor to cut weight on their protein intake to preserve the remaining kidney mass, which is half the kidneys. So not only does the recipient of a kidney transplant need to eat a low protein diet so that they can preserve that donated kidney, the donor is also officially told by kidney doctors to eat a low protein diet. Now, when I say officially told, it may be mentioned. Or, you know, not or probably not, but they're supposed to tell both donor and recipient that they need to preserve their kidney function by eating a low protein diet. But, uh, what they usually do, I have to tell you from my experience, which fortunately has been limited. I've been away from dialysis rooms for a long time, but it's uh, <clears throat> the diet kidney dietitian or doctor comes in and says to the patient who fail, has failing kidneys, you need to be on a low protein diet. And oh, by the way, come on down and see our new dialysis machine. <laughs> I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just cardiologists. It's not just oncologists. It's kidney specialists. It's, like it's, it, it's I mean, this is business. These people make their living from doing these things to you. You know, uh, that's their job. They're not trying to hurt you. They're not bad people. It's just business. And you need to be aware that it's business and you need to get the other side of the story. In other words, the risks and the benefits and you need to get the food picture too, so that you can keep yourself as healthy as possible. 
Uh, I know there are a lot of professionals out there listening to this program, and there are a few cardiologists who commented on my thoughts last week, but you didn't prove one of them wrong, and you know exactly what I said was true. Uh, right. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just trying to do my job as a doctor, which is to give you my patients, and those of you who I'm a mentor to in terms of your medical business, I'm trying to give you my viewpoint not only to protect you from uh, unnecessary treatments, but also to take advantage of the food. I've been told so many times here in my career, which I've been doing for uh, before over four decades, that people have said to me, they come up to me and say, hey, McDougal, why don't you just keep to the diet stuff and stop talking about the heart disease and the cancer therapies and getting laws passed against doctors doing unnecessary mastectomies, which I did back in 1982, and getting a law passed in California that makes doctors learn about human nutrition. Uh, Why don't you just do your food thing and just kind of leave the politics and, and, and leave our businesses business. alone, you yeah, know, I mean, just get real. But I haven't been able to do that because, uh, you know, when I became a doctor, as I know all doctors did, they did it to help people. And I just couldn't see them as two separate issues one teaching you how to eat well and the other to tell you how to avoid unnecessary harmful procedures uh, like mastectomies and like uh, 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 cardiac revascularization in people with chronic coronary artery disease and uh, most of the chemotherapies that are being done do far more harm than good you know this you know we've talked about the death rate from cancer hasn't right. changed since 1975. you know you're you're being uh, You'd be allowed to. And, uh, you know, I just plain and simple always thought it was my duty to tell people what I thought was the truth. Now, as again, I say, I told you, I'm not always right. Uh, but uh, I am most of the time. And uh, I make mistakes, but not often. And I'm welcome to be corrected. Mm -hmm. You know, like I did a couple of times on my last week's show. I, when I learned something new, I have to share with you. And if I'm really, really wrong, I mean, Bring it to my attention. I'll tell the story or send uh, Gustavo a, a letter and say, look, I'm a doctor or I'm a lawyer or I'm a whatever. And we want this attention brought up or we want to be on the show. I've always told yes, you. Yes, we want you know, to come on the show and we will uh, be happy to give you uh, equal time. Right. And by the way, remember that the, the um, um, email address to send questions is webinar at drmcdougal.com. Someone there, uh, Dr. McGregor, sent a question asking about how long does it take on a starch-based diet to help regulate heavy menstrual cycles? Well, it involves uh, several things. <clears throat> the food itself uh, will, will change your estrogen levels. And uh, so if you eat animal foods, uh, they're often doctored with estrogens. They shoot the animals with estrogen. That was a real problem, particularly in Puerto Rico about 30 years ago. That little children, like three years old, were getting breasts, and males were getting the pubic hair. And so, so it's the animal infusion uh, with uh, hormones that takes place. Now, I don't know what the, how common it is in what country, where, but it used to be a universal practice. So don't hold me on what's being done at the present time. I haven't looked it up. Uh, there's the actual animal food itself, the animal fat which is uh and proteins which are converted into estrogen like substances uh there are uh, uh environmental chemicals they are they have estrogenic effects like uh, you know like like ddt and pcbs and uh other other chemicals and i'm pretty sure ddt and pcb fall in that class but there are other uh chemicals that act like estrogens and when you eat high in the food chain, you take in these estrogen mimicking chemicals. So you got that factor. So there's a whole bunch of things change. Your bowel bacteria change, and bowel bacteria that you eat, uh, uh, that you grow on eating the American diet, have a uh, very good ability to convert uh, precursors into estrogens. And the plant parts, they actually block estrogen from being absorbed into your system. Uh, exercise is another factor. People who ever exercise heavily will lose their period because more calories are going out there and coming in. 
and, and nature says, you know, just by its intent that if there's not enough food around, you're not allowed to ovulate. And so you're not allowed to have periods. That happened, uh, you know, during starvation situations around the world. Uh, world War II, people were in prisoner war camps. The women stopped menstruating because there wasn't enough food. So the body said, uh, no food, no eggs, no babies. <clears throat> So uh, in answer to your question is the, it was when you change your diet, things change pretty quick. And as you lose the weight, you stop making estrogen in your body fat. Uh, your body fat sells a little estrogen factories. So that may be involved in the timing of, of, of when the periods become lighter, less bleeding, and they become more far apart in the month. Instead of say being 26 days, they become 28 days on a healthy diet. So that may involve a lot of different factors in terms of bowel bacteria, kinds of foods, body weight, and so on. As far as getting your period back, say you eat a very low fat diet, very healthy, uh, even, even too low, maybe you're starving and you're exercising and your body says you're starving, you can't have eggs. Uh, you, you have to stop, reduce your exercise and increase your calorie intake. So there's a whole bunch of variables involved, in it, but the diet has a huge impact on how much you bleed, when you bleed, how far apart you bleed, when you stop, start puberty. Uh, in our society, the last study I'm aware of said that half the black girls in our society develop pubic hair and breast buds when they're eight years old. Eight years old. And uh, white girls, it was around uh, 10. And little boys, uh, there's an article in pediatrics that shows little boys are starting to get facial hair when, on, on the Western diet, uh, you know, a couple years earlier. And 3% of black girls back when that study was published started puberty when they were three years old. And uh, so puberty is different than uh, first onset of menstruation. Puberty is when you get breast buds and pubic hair growing in, uh, and uh, you know, your first menstruation is when you bleed. So there were several ways of varying this, uh, of measuring what goes on in terms of precocious puberty in your children. And clearly, uh, children on a Western diet go undergo puberty <clears throat> about four years younger than they should. And so you've got little kids, little boys and girls that are supposed to be riding bikes mm -hmm. and playing checkers and studying their math. And what are they thinking about? They're thinking about things like adults do. And you know how strong your sexual thoughts are. You know, those are for adults. They're not for little children. And when you give those uh, reproductive functions and feelings to little children, you, you ruin your children, you ruin your family, you ruin your schools, you ruin your communities by introducing this variable into, uh, you know, giving a, a child uh, functions and intentions and thoughts they're not supposed to have until they're, say, 16 or even as late as 18 years old. That's when you're supposed to have babies. That's when you're supposed to have this interest. So we got a whole screwed up society because of this precocious puberty as a consequence of eating a bad diet, uh, a diet full of animals and oils and lacking starch. And, uh, you know, it's something that, that you would think that a, a civilized popular population of people would, would fix. I mean, civilized people take care of their children. Yeah. Let me say that again. Civilized people take care of their children. We are not civilized. You know, we do, we do horrible things to our kids. Uh, you know, a, a third of them are fat and 17% of them are obese and they're, they're going through a puberty when they're 7, 8, 9, 10 years old and they suffer terrible bowel problems and constipation and acne and they can't perform on the athletic field like uh, Carl Lewis once did and marathon runners do. I mean, well, just think of what we're doing to our kids in our society. It, I guess I can be pretty much. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a form of child abuse. And child I, abuse. Um, if, if any group of people or a terrorist or anybody did the kind of harm, like what we're seeing, we would be after them now. I, I, yeah, you, you know, if somebody, if somebody did this, just to put it as bluntly as Gustavo was saying, if we cause this kind of pain, I'm talking about stomach pain, and early menstruation, and, deforming acting. If we cause this kind of pain to people with a stick, we put them in jail. But because we do it with a fork and spoon, it's okay. okay. And because policemen and school teachers and ministers 
because they do it to their children, it's okay. But ladies and gentlemen, it hurts just as bad for those kids to be harmed with a fork and spoon. And just because nice people do it doesn't make it right. You know, it, it just <laughs> amazes me that uh, most of our listeners out there are in the same kind of disgust, anger, and protest that I convey. But it's really that serious, and we must get the message out to stop this terrible harm to ourselves and the world and other animals and planet. And, I mean, this is not business that should be talked of lightly, or at least you will not find me talking of it lightly. Uh, it's everything to me. And it has been for 40 years, yeah. and, that, and that's one of the reasons people object to me. Is that, you know, and why they say Dr. Lin is so nice? <laughs> he says such a nicer guy than I am. I'm not a nice guy. <laughs> you know, plain and simple, I, I don't tend to be cruel or, or, or unpolitical. It's just my nature. And, you know, when I think of something, I don't have time to couch it in comfort for you. But there was, a, I, I told you all, I think, a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> that uh, uh, the hairdresser, I go get my hair cut, uh, one of the ladies uh, who's a vegan, just for, for a vegan reason, she has a, a big, big sticker on the back of her window that says, uh, if you'd like to become a, a vegan in four, four hours and, and 50 minutes, this is what you do. You watch Four oh, Children Nights, yeah. then you watch uh, Cowspiracy, and then you watch Earthlings. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I tried to watch Earthlings one time. Oh, I couldn't get through it. No, you can't. Yeah, I mean, as much as as hardened as I am, I couldn't watch half the movie. It was just, just so unbelievably uh, cruel. I mean, yeah. it's, it's but but disgusting. but but it's made a huge difference. I mean, any of you who have friends and relatives who are just you know big macho killers and meat eaters and so on, hey. I can't watch it with you, but just sit down and watch your things. <laughs> right. You'll realize what we're doing and, and how true it is and harmful. Uh, Dr. Monroe, we're getting, getting to the end of the, our webinar here, but I'd like to ask, this is a question from me. Okay. If you had yeah. all, I don't know, $10 million at your disposal or more, what kind of research would you like to see done in what area? Uh, if I had $10 million or more, I actually had a million. But I yeah, spent that's on right. Best research. Uh, I would do nothing. I would do no research at all because all the research that needs to be done has been done. Now, ask me a better question. What if I was king? <laughs> you know, what if I was king? Okay, what and, if you were king? And, and I had a chance to do whatever I wanted. In your kingdom, what would in you my do? my kingdom. Well, I, I would introduce uh, the, the changes that I want to do. Uh, I would uh, stop, I would stop, break coal. I don't care whether they have to drive taxi cabs. Or whatever they have to do, I would stop the unnecessary chemotherapies. I'd stop the unnecessary mutilating cancer surgeries. Now realize there are some of these things that are good, so don't don't get me wrong. There's just, there's some good things in these. They're just really small in number. I'd stop the unnecessary catheterizations and heart surgeries. I would force schools to serve proper food in schools. I would force dietitians to tell the truth. I would force physicians. Hey, I'm kidding. I was pretty good. I'm pretty good. I, 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 would force, I would force physicians to teach patients who had dietary diseases that the diseases were caused by diet, just like I did with SB 380. When I wrote that law in California back in 2011, I, I'm not supposed to say I wrote it, but I did. And it was unanimously passed by both houses of our legislature in Sacramento, California. It was signed September 11th by 2011. September 11th. 2011 by Governor Jerry Brown. We have a law in, in California that says doctors must learn. Well, we have 11 medical schools that do not teach about human nutrition in California. And that law, you can look at it, just look up SB 380 California. <clears throat> that law in 13 places in a page and a half says that we must teach diet and nutrition to medical professionals, but it's not been followed. It's been, and I would go through some discussion about why uh, it has been stopped and why I've just kind of given up on it. But I would enforce SB 380 right. so that all the medical schools in California had to teach doctors of human beings what human beings eat. And that at least half the medical conferences have to be sponsored uh, to teach nutrition, not by the drug companies. 
We need, for we need, to, put, oh, we need to put this in a document, call it Dr. McDougal. Dr. Uh, McDougal is king. Kingdom. <laughs> he is the king. And, and I know you have very good reason for me to, uh, to not talk this way, and, uh, and I'll never be king. Well, a lot of people appreciate your way of talking. Very you know, well, straightforward. Well, that's good. But, you know, somebody has to do it someday. Somebody has to do it. As we, as we said, you know, I'm, I, I should be retired now. Oh but no! Well, you know, there I never will because I have nothing else to do. But someday, enough uh, men and women out there will stand up. And I told you last time why you don't do it, why the doctors don't stop this unnecessary heart surgery, why they're acting cowardly. And the reason is is because they would be criticized by their colleagues, they'd be fired from the medical group. You know, a lot of patients would stop coming to them if they didn't do these tests and treatments on them. So I understand why you act this way, but it's not right. And, and I would never criticize you personally for acting cowardly and not standing up for your patients, because you are. You know, you are. And someday you may get in a position where you, uh, and some of you have, where you're willing to stand up and say, uh, this is the truth, I don't care what sacrifice that I have to make. Uh, we're going to get the truth told. Uh, you know, I, as I said, I never took an oath to support medical businesses, but I did take an oath to protect my patients, and so did all of you. And when you let this kind of behavior go on, these excessive treatments and tests, whether they be drugs or surgery or other types of, uh, of harm to patients, uh, I know in your, in your mind you know this is wrong, and you'd like to do something about it. Just let's just hope someday you're able to stand up and say what you really mean and make the changes that are long overdue. Because <clears throat> I certainly haven't been able to. I've been able to say what I think, but I haven't made, been able to make the changes that I thought that would happen when people knew the truth. I mean, at one time, mastectomy use went down. And at one time, people used to uh, warn against PSA testing. And, uh, you know, there used to be concerns about all the chemotherapies we gave, but those have kind of vanished in the, in the shadow of all the money. Mm -hmm. And so there are more mastectomies done now these days, and, and more men are getting PSA tests. And I told you, angioplasty went, it started in 1970, 1978. First angioplasty was done, first 50 cases reported. And now in the US there are over 800,000 done every year. And my guess is 90% of them are done unnecessarily. Even if you change your diet just by the rules, 90% I guess are done unnecessarily. <clears throat> and if you changed your diet, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe it's 70%. But if you added a good diet on top of that, I bet it would be 90% you wouldn't have to do. There's no motivation to do it. I can take you, maybe I'll take you on the way back to, back to where you're staying, I'll take you past our new hospital. We got a new set of hospital, the biggest, most beautiful building in all of Santa Rosa. You know, it's just like when you go to Las Vegas and you go to the casinos. How do they build those That's casinos? Right. Oh, what, 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 what is this? They're going to give me all this money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you go to India, you go to China. The biggest, most beautiful buildings in your town are cancer centers, heart centers, mm -hmm. hospitals. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that's where the money is. That's the business. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. It was. And uh, if we didn't answer your questions, make sure you send an email to webinar at drmatugo.com. And we'll have another uh, question and answer next week. Sounds good to me. All right. Okay, okay. folks. And thank you very much. Thank you. Lot, thank lot you so much this. for, um, for doing this. And tell, tell everybody, and I have to say this, tell everybody to watch the webinars. Tell them to go to the website. Tell them the news that is free. There are no gimmicks. You can also tell them how John and Mary still make their living and help support their family. We go on these phenomenal trips like one of the last in two yes. weeks. And we're going to Kauai in January. And we've got what Mary sold out three times now for Kauai. <laughs> That's we're going great. to Kauai and we're doing an advanced study weekend. And oh, uh, yeah. I keep telling oh, them, I'm going to tell you what this is going to be about. This is going to be such a special weekend. So I have to wait till next week. Maybe we'll talk about it. Okay, in September, right? In or week? October. When September, 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 I think 16th. Right. Well, that that. Yes. And we have 10 day programs where I am still the boss <laughs> and the doctor. Dr. <laughs> Linda says helping. Actually, he does a phenomenal yeah. addition program. So we have lots of things we can get together personally, but everything's free. 
Everything is free on the website, or you can go to a used bookstore and buy the books for 50 cents. And so we will and, and we'll do a, a webinar to show you all the wealth of information that there is in, in that website. So very good. We shall see you all next week then. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. Goodbye.